Hello, welcome to our Bible study this afternoon. We're in the book of 1 John. I'm your host, Albert Armitage, and we have been studying these last several sessions on chapter 1. Today we go into chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where we'll be looking at three specific words dealing with the work in the ministry of God the Son. As we begin, I do want to make a summary statement concerning the aspect, as we saw at the end of this last study in chapter 1, what it means to walk in the light. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the light. We know that from John chapter 1. And so as we are considering this, the thing for us to realize then is that we expose ourselves to the very Word of God, the, the living person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are doing that, we will come under conviction for the sins of falling short. The Greek word harmartia means that I have missed the mark of God's high calling in our life or in my life. And so at that, then we will recognize that sometimes we did it in ignorance and sometimes we did it while uh, knowing deliberately that we were sinning against God. But the more that we walk in the light, that is reading God's word, we are exposing ourselves, and so therefore we come under conviction. Another thing that we notice, too, from this portion that we just finished, is that this conviction, then, will lead us to confession. We will confess that we have fallen short of the honor and glory of God in every aspect of our lives of which the Word of God has been revealed to us. And so we will pray and ask for forgiveness of the sins that we've been committing, that is, falling short of what it is that God has planned for us in our life. This will cleanse us, and we learn that as we're looking at these next couple of verses, and that's very important. We need cleansing, and the only one that can do that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, as a result of that conviction, the confession, and the cleansing that's taking place, we find ourselves having a renewed fellowship with God, and that brings us now into chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So as we continue, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can come into your presence. We thank you for giving us the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, so that we could have eternal redemption, that we might be able to spend our time with you in the heavenlies and in that future that you have for us in our glorified bodies. We thank you. We praise you again. We look to your leading and guiding us. Help us, Lord, not to fall short or to miss the mark of your high calling that you have in our lives. But expose us as we're studying the Word of God and bring to our illumination the things that we need to know so that we can live the way that you would like us to live. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Here then, in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll exegete these. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That is 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, considering for a moment his attitude that the Apostle John has here for those to whom he's writing, he's referring to them as my little children. The purpose of him recognizing these individuals as little children was not because he was uh, degrading them or anything like that or trying to talk down to them, but to show his own intimate care that he has for all of those other individuals to whom he has led to the Lord and that he's been teaching. So it's not disrespectful, my little children. It is a way of expressing his love, his concern for all of those individuals. Then he says, these things write I unto you. Interesting use of the uh, words that are being used here that are translated as I write. This one is emphasizing to us that it's going to be something that he wants to make sure gets passed on from one generation to the next. And so he's looking at it as this is just the beginning of the things that I would love to share with you. But the first thing I have to point out to you is is that 
that ye sin not. Again, there's that word harmartia, falling short of the honor and the glory of the Lord, missing the mark of his high calling in our life. And so you have here uh, the use of this uh, verb that's used here is to emphasize this is the beginning of it. If we will recognize that the honor and the glory of God, we are missing the mark of his high calling in our life. This is the beginning of this cleansing and of this relationship that's going to be so wondrous and so beautiful with the Godhead through the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's in, emphasizing here that ye sin not. Well, another thing that we can notice here too, he says that if any man sin, now the word if doesn't mean that the person is uh, never going to sin. The key here is, is that this particular word, if, is being used here to show us we are going to be committing sin. The problem is, is that we are not to be committing the kinds of sin that we are repeating over and over and over again. Once we recognize that we have sinned, we confess that sin before the Lord. He, who is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins, he's going to cleanse us and thus give us a new attitude towards that sin. But then he goes on to say something here that is also very, very important to us. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. This one is the first of three words that I would like us to give consideration to uh, in this regard today. Actually, there's five words total, but this first one is the word advocate. It is actually used five times in the New Testament. This is the only place where this word is being translated as the word advocate. The other four times, this word is translated as the comforter. It's the word that has the root of parakletos, the paraclete. So you either have parakletos or uh, parakleton. Uh, both of those words have the same root word, paraclete, which is talking about the one who is the comforter that comes along beside us. He enables us. He helps us uh, in our times of living. And it's not just in our times of need. It's because of this unbroken fellowship. You ever had a bird that was a parakeet? That's where this word comes from. So I want you to realize, too, that the advocate that we have, this paraclete that we have uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ, he actually, in these other passages in which we're going to be looking right now, the first one is found for us in the book of John, and it's going to be in the 14th chapter. So let's look at uh, John chapter 14 for just a moment. And we're going to consider the words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke concerning the ministry of the paraclete. Now, we know that here we find in 1 John chapter 2, and in that first verse, we have an advocate with the Father. That is, he's our paraclete. Well, notice what he says in John 14 then, beginning here in verse 16. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. There's that word paraclete, that he may abide with you forever. Interesting thing too about the use of the word forever here. And this is one of the things that's very special about how God related these things to us in the Greek language. It's S, excuse me, aston uh, arene. And that word means into the eternity. So when we look at this, and it's translated here, that he may abide with you forever, realize it means that the paraclete, the comforter, that he may abide with you into the eternity. And so that's an exciting aspect of this. But notice too in here that Jesus is telling his disciples that he is going to uh, pray to the Father and the Father is going to give us another comforter. Jesus Christ was our first comforter. Now we realize that he's going to send God the Holy Spirit, and he's going to do this by way of uh, praying and asking the Father. So that's one. Then in verse 26, he's speaking again about the comforter, but this time he identifies specifically who the comforter is. Now he kind of did that in verse 17, because he said, even the Spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive because it receives him not, neither knows him, but ye know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Now, the shall be in you actually took place at the time of Pentecost. So this was kind of a prophecy here for those disciples too. But looking now, he calls him the spirit of truth in verse 17. Verse 26, he says, but the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit is identified as being the spirit of truth, and the Holy Spirit was uh, sent to us by God, and the Lord Jesus Christ was uh, the one who was praying that the Holy Spirit would come. So that's very exciting to me. Now, turn over another page, look at chapter 15 here in the Gospel of John, at verse 26. In verse 26, he said, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. So don't get confused about this. The Lord Jesus Christ said in chapter 14 that what he's going to do is he's going to have uh, his prayer and ask that the Father will send him. But in the process, we also realize he says, I am sending the Holy Spirit to you. I'm asking the Father to do it. He's asking the Father to do it through me or for me because he's praying and asking. That's a, quite a blessing there too. But now he ties together what he said about the Comforter in chapter 14. Remember in verses 16 and 17. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, that brings up another very deep theological session for us to be giving consider to, consideration to sometime in the future, and that is the fact of where he says, who proceeds from the Father. So we'll look at that another time. I don't want to deal with that today because that's another whole study on its own. And then in chapter 16, possibly still on the same page in your Bible, notice what he says then in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Then there's a threefold ministry of the Comforter that is mentioned in verses 8, 9, 10, um, excuse me, verses 9, 10, 11. But he says, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. Those three things are mentioned in verse 8. And then 9, 10, 11 describe how he's going to apply that. Of sin, because they believe not on me. That's the whole key to what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. Verse 10, he goes on, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me not, or you see me no more. So here we find in that the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, we can't proceed with the plans and the things that I have for you in my life for you until I go to be with the Father. And then verse 11, he says, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Without the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will not be able to complete the things that he has for you and me in holiness and in righteousness and of judgment. He can't complete that until his death, burial, and resurrection. So that's very, very exciting even from that aspect. Well, let's look at another aspect of this advocacy or the intercession ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ has for us. In Romans, the eighth chapter, there's a list of things that he's talking about here, uh, especially beginning in verse 31, about things that would separate us from the love of God. And he says, and I'm going to just summarize this because I have many other passages for us to look at this uh, study time. He says in verse 34, Who is he that condemns? Shall Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? So the Lord Jesus Christ is our advocate. Remember, it's the same basic uh, Greek word, paraclete, uh, parakleton or parakletos. And so uh, as a result of this, he's our advocate. He's at the right hand of the Father. He is making intercession for us. So again, all of these words are used 
uh, very similarly. One last passage I'd like us to look at before we go back to uh, the book of 1 John is found for us in the book of Hebrews, and it is found in chapter 7, and it's verse 24. While you're turning there, verse 23 says, And they truly were many priests, because they were not allowed to continue by reason of death. But this man, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, because he continues ever, in other words, he has no end, because he continues ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also, lost my place here for a moment, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, or come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 to 25. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are both making intercession for us, and they live forever. So God the Holy Spirit's praying for you. He's interceding for you. He's helping you out in your life. He's giving you victory over the harmartia. That is the many times that we miss the mark of God's high calling in our life. God is doing this for us. So back then again in 1 John chapter 2, and in that first verse, uh, he said that he is our advocate with the Father. And then it went on to say, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I found it exciting to note, too, that it, it has the definite article there, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. The definite article, if it had not been there, um, would have weakened the importance of Jesus Christ being righteous, and he is the righteous one. So that's very, very important. Well, notice too, in verse uh, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, as we think about this, um, what is the idea behind propitiation? Well, propitiation is the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied all of the righteous demands that the Father had for the penalty of our sins. Jesus Christ satisfied all of those righteous demands. So why do people die and go to hell today? Let's look back again at John chapter 3. Spe specifically, verses 17 and 18. For in this portion of Scripture, it is very, very clear why it is that people die without Christ, they die and they go to hell, and why they have the future judgment for the penalty that's in their lives. And he says here in verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That one who is the eternally generated one, God the Son, the only begotten, that one person is the one that we have to believe in. It is a very narrow way that leads to eternal life. And that narrow pathway, that narrow roadway, is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other method. There's no other way in which a person can get into heaven. It's not by good works. It's not by baptisms. It's not by uh, the uh, possibility of being reincarnated. It's none of those things. We have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior in this lifetime. We have to do it now. I encourage you, please do not put that off. But let's consider now, there's three different words that are used to describe the ministry of propitiation uh, that our Lord Jesus Christ has for us. The first one is found for us here in the book of 1 John, it's in chapter 2 that we just read here. He is the propitiation for our sins. He satisfied the righteous demands of the Father for the penalty for our sins. He satisfied that. But then it's not just for us. He says, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus died so that everybody 
could have that penalty for their sin being removed from them. But it's only applied to those individuals who receive the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is eternal life. Believing that he is God, believing in their death, burial, and resurrection, trusting him. Furthermore, we find this same word is being used for us in chapter 4 and in verse 10. Same Greek word. Yeah, the same root uh, for the word uh, propitiation is used here. So in chapter 4 then, notice what he says in the 10th verse. Here in his love, not that we have loved God. We don't come to God because we loved him. We come to God because he first loved us and then we came to him. But that he loved us and sent his son, the propitiation for our sins. Jesus knew from the very start when he created the heavens and the earth that he was going to die on a cross. We'll put him on the cross so that he could shed his blood for us and deliver us from the penalties of our sin. So here in his love, not that we loved God, meaning that we didn't love him first, but God loved us first. And this goes all the way back to eternity past but that he loved us and sent his son, the propitiation for our sins. There is no other way that the penalty for our sins can be removed except through God the Son, the propitiation for our sins. Now, there's another word that is related to this very same word, and it's spelled almost identically the same, but the root word is the same. And this one is found for us in two places. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews the ninth chapter. In Hebrews chapter 9 and in the fifth verse, notice what we find here. Let me get to that portion of scripture. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5. It says, And over it the cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. The same word, same root word that is used for propitiation is used here for the covering of the mercy seat that was in the tabernacle and later in the temple of God. And so as a result of that, here we find this word talking about the propitiation was also being described here as the covering that goes over the mercy seat. Another place in which we find the same kind of reference is found for us in the book of Romans and in the third chapter, Romans chapter 3, you will recall that in uh, the verses previous to the one that we're going to be looking at in verse 25, he says for us, beginning in verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, propitiation, the foundation, is the fact that Jesus Christ satisfied all the righteous demands that the Father had for the penalty for our sins, leads us now to this 24th verse here where we find we have been justified. That word justified, when we believe on him, means that you have been judicially declared by God. It's a judicial statement. He makes the statement as the judge that you have been declared righteous. And that's what justification is. It's Jesus Christ judicially, or the Father judicially declaring you and me to be righteous. And then he says, freely by his grace. And how did that come? Through redemption. Now there's three different Greek words that deal with redemption. We'll talk about that also at another time. But the concept of taking all three of those Greek words together is this. You and I have been purchased out of the slave market of sin, never ever to be able to be put back into it again. So therefore, you can never lose your salvation once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now verse 25, for this second word that's being used here. Whom God hath set forth a propitiation through faith in his blood. There's that word propitiation again. God was the Jesus Christ satisfied the Father's righteous demands for the penalty for our sins. And he says this was through the blood, excuse me, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. That word remission 
is translated in the book of Acts as the word forgiveness. So when we talk about the remission of sins, we're also talking about the forgiveness of sins. The third word that is translated uh, from this Greek word that's translated uh, from propitiation is found for us in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2 and in verse 17. So Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 17. I'll be there in just a moment. That'll also give you all some time to um, turn to this portion of scripture too. So Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 17, we find the following. Again, the same root word, propitiation. And we find here then in this uh, Hebrews 2 verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. The word that is translated there as merciful is another aspect of these Greek words that are referring to the fact that Jesus Christ was the propitiation for our sins. One last passage for us to look at is found for us in Luke chapter 18. And again, it still has to do with the mercy of God. So Luke chapter 2, excuse me, Luke chapter 18 and then in verse 13, we find the following. And the tax collector, the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be propitious or merciful to me, a sinner. God, I'm not worthy of the repentance of which I'm asking. I fall short of your honor and glory all the time. I miss the mark of your high calling in my life. I've done so much for which I need your forgiveness. And so, Lord, be merciful unto me. Let Jesus Christ be the propitiation for my sins, satisfying all the righteous demands that you have for my sin. Cover them up. Be the covering for me over that mercy seat. That's what this man was asking. Well, I hope that you've appreciated our study this time this evening as we've been studying the Word of God, and we just want to hope and pray that you will confess your sins before the Lord, trusting Jesus Christ to be your Savior. For God sent not a Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of the Son of God. Amen. John 3, 16, 17, and 18 once again. So thank you for joining us this evening. I've been your host, Albert Armitage. May God bless each and every one of you.